Let me invite you to take your copy of God's Word and open with me to John chapter 16 this morning. John 16. Uh, I am wearing this lapel uh, today again, so this will, when I do this, it gets louder. And when I'm up here, so, you know, just bear with me, all right? It's, it's not my voice, it's, it's, it's the microphone, so hopefully it's not a distraction for you. But John 16, 33, uh, let me just start with this illustration. Uh, several, every year, several thousand people make the trip to uh, San Jose, California, California to visit this mysterious Winchester mansion. I knew nothing of this. I've been to the Biltmore House. Um, several of you have been to the White House. You've been to Graceland. Maybe you've never been to the mysterious Winchester mansion, but it is a thing. Uh, it is renowned for its size. It is renowned for its architectural curiosities. There are lots of things in it that don't make sense. Uh, it, is, it is renowned for its lack of any master building plan. Uh, there were no plans to, to build it the way that it is today. You see, the story goes that Sarah Winchester, who was the wife of uh, the rifle and gun magnate uh, William Wirt Winchester of the Winchester Rifles, uh, his wife, she began building this house in 1884. And for 38 years straight, she built this house. It wasn't that it took 38 years to complete it in its original design. It just took 38 years for her to be satisfied with the work. In fact, she, when, she, when it was finished, she wasn't satisfied. It was only finished because she died. And for 38 years, constant construction took place on this mansion, the Winchester Mansion there in San Jose. The story is that Mrs. Winchester believed that she would be haunted by all those who were killed by her husband's guns if she stopped building this house. And so for 38 straight years until she passed away, she kept ordering more and more renovations and more and more construction. Today, if you were to go see this house in San Jose, you would come across some 10,000 windows. You would come across doors and stairways that lead to blank walls. You would, you would come to this house that has a total of 160 rooms, and you would come to a house that if you were to build the same thing today, you would need $70 million plus dollars to build this house. It is an enormous house, and it was all built on Mrs. Winchester's pointless, hopeless search for peace. She was so afraid that she would be haunted that it it, it launched her onto this constant search for peace, and she was desperate for it. And it, she, it caused her to build these pointless additions to this house for 38 years. You know, the reality is that for so many people, there is, they're in just as big a search, just as desperate, desperate for peace today. People are searching for it, and they can't find it because it cannot be found outside of the gospel of Christ. Peace is this elusive pursuit outside of the gospel. You know, I, I want to show you today in these passages, I, I just contrast this. I'm going to read 1633 in John and think about Mrs. Winchester in this 38-year pursuit of, of peace and listen to the words of Jesus in John 1633. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. If you were to go to other places like Colossians 3.15, Colossians 3.15 tells us to let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. The reality is that for so many, hearing that command, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, and actually being at peace are two different things. And today I want to show you the fruit of peace. We are in this series, in the fruit of the Spirit, and today we come to peace, and I want to show you today three different things. The universal need for peace, the peace that is available in the gospel, and then that you and I are called to bear the fruit of peace as we live in this world. So if you will, pray with me, and we'll look at these things together. Lord Jesus, thank you that you love us. Lord, we would not love you today if you had not first loved us. Lord, today... There is peace to be had, to be found in you and you alone. God, I pray today that through the preaching of your word, that the Spirit would, would move and take the truth and place it into hearts. And God, that today, people in, in the hearing of my voice, Lord, would receive and finally find peace in you. 
God, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me show you a few things from the Bible today. Multiple passages will be in several different places. But first off, the universal need for peace. Everyone needs peace. Everybody is looking for peace. We have been raised in this world, this universe that is at war. We think of peace and we, and we think of, of an absence of conflict. And really, nobody can go anywhere where there is not some conflict or the potential for it in all arenas of life. Let me show you a few of these arenas. We are in need of peace with God. Genesis 3, verses 8 through 10, the first two chapters of Genesis, everything is wonderful. God has made the universe. Everything is good. He has said it multiple times. It is good. It is good. It is very good. And then Genesis 3 comes along, and Adam and Eve are placed there in the garden, and they had been used to, at this point, in the cool of the day, walking with God and having this, this wonderful relationship with Him, unbroken fellowship with Him, so the same way that you and I might come together, sit on a porch together in the evening, in the cool of the evening, drink a glass of tea or whatever your beverage is, and have a conversation. This was what Adam and Eve had with God. And listen to what, how the story changes in Genesis 3, verses 8 through 10. They had chosen to rebel against God, eat the fruit that he commanded them not to. And in verse 8 it says, Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked And I hid myself. For the first time in history, man is now afraid of God. Why? Because sin has now entered the picture and broken the fellowship between between Adam and Eve and all of, of his descendants and God himself. For the first time, Adam runs into the bushes and hides from God. He is now, this relationship of peace that he knew with God has been broken, and now he finds himself at odds or at war with God himself. You see, the world would have you believe that in this account, if this account is real, they would say, that certainly God didn't hold this against them forever. God merely scolded them, then told them how much he loved them, and then forgot about the whole thing. Your flesh would have you to believe that certainly, surely, God can't hold you responsible for what Adam and Eve did that day. I mean, you weren't even there. The devil would have you to believe that God is really just making too big of a thing of the, of the whole thing, and, and really he should just kind of forget about it. I mean, it's not worth eternal wrath. But the reality is, no matter what the world or your flesh or the devil would have you to believe, the Bible tells us a different story. The Bible tells us that because of sin, Adam's and our own, that we are at enmity with God, James 4, 4. And that we have become children of wrath, Ephesians 2, 3. That he, God, when we talk about him outside of the gospel, if we have no access to him through Jesus alone, if, if we're just in our own merits, the Bible tells us that we cannot refer to him as the man upstairs or the big guy in the sky. That, that he is, he's not your sweet grandfather who just loves to tell you funny things, tell you jokes and has candy in his pockets and just hands out candy all the time. But instead that God, for the one without the gospel... You're at war with him. That he will punish sin. He will pour out judgment and wrath on all sin. And if you are in your sin, then you have a big problem. You need peace because you are at war with God. A second arena where you and I, everyone needs peace is not only with God, but with other people. If we continue in the story there of Genesis 3 and Adam and Eve in 11 and 12, God said, have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to me, she gave me the fruit and I ate it. Now, up to this point, not only had the relationship between Adam and Eve and God been great, but the relationship between Adam and Eve had been great. Well, there's no, no record here of any disagreement, any conflict, any sort of turmoil in the relationship between Adam and Eve at all. But for the first time, when sin enters the picture, Adam throws his wife under the bus. Now, don't you know, for the next few days after that, 
things were a little chilly there at, at, at the home place, right? And it, it was not going to be good because Adam had just sold Eve out, not just in a casual conversation to anybody, but to God himself, right? Throw her under the bus. The woman you gave to me, she gave it to me, and I just did what she wanted me to do. Lord, it's her fault. We've, we come just in the very next chapter. We're in the third chapter of the Bible. We come to the very next chapter, the fourth chapter, and all of a sudden we had the very first murder in all of human history. That Cain kills his own brother, Abel. Not just kills him with words, but he kills him. Literally takes his life. See, the reality is we need peace. Everyone, not just here in this room, but everyone, all the people that you will encounter at any point of your life, we all need peace, not only with God, but with one another. We all know that where there are two or more people gathered, that there is the potential for conflict. Maybe it won't happen all the time, but there's always the potential there. Don't believe me? Go on a road trip with somebody. You say, oh, we're... We're best friends. We never argue. Drive across the country with them. See what happens, right? Listen, my wife and I, we just celebrated our 23rd wedding anniversary. And I know for some of you that's like 23rd, uh, you got a long way to go still. But for us, 23 years, you know? The first six months of our marriage, awful. And I'm not telling you anything that she wouldn't tell you. She might use another word and it would be worse, right? I mean, it, it, was, it was terrible the first six months of our marriage. And the reason for that was because there was a sinner that came together with a sinner in union. And the reality for us was I got married when I was 21 years old. She was 20. And, uh, and I had just finished my freshman year of college. And I had been hanging out with my boys after class. And I would go over to their place and, and we would play video games and we would shoot the breeze and watch sports and all this kind of stuff and we got married and I thought I could still do all those things till two or three in the morning come home and expect for my wife to be there just doting on me and I realized that I was asking way too much that I had me at the center of my universe and I needed peace with my wife so the reality is that for all of us anytime we deal with anybody no matter how much you love them there is the potential for conflict. We need peace with one another. 23 years later, we don't fight nearly as much. I don't come home at 2 or 3 in the morning, you know. I, I'm, I'm considered of my wife. Do we still have arguments? What do you think? <laughs> right? Yeah. But we have grown and we continue to grow. But we still need peace with one another. I still get selfish. She at times still gets selfish. And we're still in this place where we need peace with other people. Not only with God and with other people, but we need peace with creation itself. And in that same account in Genesis 3, in verses 17 through 19, when, when God comes to Adam, he said, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread... Until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So the reality is, we live in a world that not only is, are we at odds with God and with one another, but even, even creation itself, even the, the plants, even everything around us seems to be warring against us. For the first time ever, sin enters the picture. And even though Adam had been given this task, this mandate to have dominion over the earth, for the first time ever, the earth fought against him. Thorns and thistles sprang up, and sweat popped out in, in the work of the dominion over the earth. And we still feel the effects of it today. Anybody ever get tired of mowing your grass? I mean, it's every week. And look, I'm, I'm thankful that we've had, we've had some rain and all this kind of stuff, but when you have rain and when you have hot temperatures in South Carolina, the grass grows. And not only does the grass grow, weeds grow. So I get tired sometimes of mowing the grass. I get through, I've told this before, I spend all day sometimes out there in my yard making everything look great. I get through at the end of the day and I sit, I take a shower and I, I, and I step out on the back porch and I look out over what I've done and before I've ever put my head on the pillow that night, there is a dandelion just sticking up going, ha ha, 
right? Fire ants? I had no idea what fire ants were when I grew up in Tennessee. We didn't have them. It took me going to Birmingham, Alabama for a year, and, and I... One Sunday morning, leaving the student center after Sunday school, going across the street to the worship center, I was standing on the corner there waiting for the light to change so I could cross the road, and all of a sudden, something was eating my leg. And not just the ankle, I mean the leg. And I was on fire, and I had no idea. I looked down, and I was standing in this mound, and all of these ants were attacking me. And we didn't have these in Tennessee. And it was all I could do not to get just indecent right there on the corner in Birmingham, Alabama, right? The, the creation wars against us. We are at war. We need peace with the creation. And one more arena with ourselves. Anybody have any, any habits that you would like to get a handle on? Maybe you have fits of anger, these outbursts that come over you. And every time you come to the end of one of those things, you say, why do I do that? I'm going to do better next time. Anybody overeat? Anybody envy? Struggle with gossip? See, we, have, we are at war even with ourselves. We have insecurities. Do you know that in 2017, there was, uh, there was over $16 billion spent in America alone on plastic surgery? We have insecurities, people wanting to change things about themselves. Even with our own mortality, Coming to grips with the fact that we will one day die. You know, exercise is good. I, I try to exercise at least five days a week, and, and I'm there, and I, I'm, I love the exercise part of that. And, but, but exercise can't prevent death. It can't, it can't guarantee that I will remain healthy. I work out with a guy who is, who's uh, approaching 70 or so. He's in great physical shape, and he has convinced himself in some ways. I don't think fully, but I think he sort of almost believes that as long as he continues to work out the way he is and eats the right things, that sickness will never touch him. Well, the reality is, the Bible says that it will indeed come to everyone, that death is inevitable unless Jesus returns. 1 Thessalonians 5.3 says, While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Last Sunday in the New York Times, there was an article ran and this was the headline. It was called The Positive Death Movement Comes to Life. And the article was about this, this, that death was becoming this popular subject in our culture. And it was not, not in a way that people were grappling, grappling and saying, what do we do with this inevitable thing? How do, we, how do we escape the hopelessness of death? But instead, there are people that there's a movement that has begun of trying to remove the sting from death outside of the gospel. There are these things called death doulas. A doula is typically assigned to a woman who's in labor, and it is typically a woman who comes alongside a pregnant woman and helps her through the, the birthing process and then even stays with her longer after the birth and encourages her and, and helps her in so many ways. Well, now someone has come up with the idea that rather than this only being at the front end of life and having these birthing doulas, but that now they should also be assigned to death itself and that someone should come alongside and just be an encouragement and sort of keep a smile on the person's face as they are walking through death's door. That somehow they, this will remove the sting of death. There are things called death cafes where people meet once a month in coffee shops and, and talk about how do we celebrate death. Well, I got news for you. You can have all the death cafes and you can have all the death doulas you want, but unless you have Christ as your Savior, the Bible tells us that you will grieve without hope. The death cannot, the sting cannot be removed outside of the gospel. We need peace with God, with other people, with, with creation itself, and with even ourselves. We live in this perpetual war zone. And we need peace. That's why Isaiah 48, 22 says there is no peace for the wicked. So everyone needs peace. And secondly, I want to show you though today is that there's this universal need of peace. But secondly, God gives peace through the gospel. That peace is not this, this elusive chase that you will never find. But instead, God says, oh, yes, you can have peace. You need peace and you can have peace. But it will come through the gospel and the gospel alone. 
God provides this. He gives peace through the, the gospel with God. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. John 14, 27, when Jesus was preparing his disciples for when he would leave, when he would be crucified and when he would ascend back to his father, Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. The reality that Jesus was pointing to there is the peace that you and I need with God because we are sinners, children of wrath, at enmity with him is the gift of the gospel. That you and I now have the assurance that we can enter boldly into the presence of God, Hebrews 10 tells us, because the curtain has been torn in two. The curtain that is his flesh was ripped for you and I, and the separation between us and God has been removed. And through Christ and Christ alone, we have access to him. We don't have to hide in the trees or the bushes with Adam, our original father. Instead, we come through Christ boldly at peace into the presence of God. God also, through the gospel, provides peace with human beings, with other people. The, the Bible tells us that we don't have perfect peace with one another, but now peace is possible with one another. That in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16... He himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in the flesh the, the, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, killing the hostility. Now, there in that passage, he's talking about Gentiles and the Jewish people. But this applies to you and I today. We've talked about this often, and perhaps you've gotten sick of me saying this, but this is a true reality for us, that if, if you and I didn't have the gospel in common this morning, chances are you're not coming in here to listen to me speak for 45 minutes. I mean, you're probably going to find something better to do with your time. You're either going to sleep in, or you're going to go to brunch, or, or you're going to do something, and we look at the world, and, and without the gospel, that's exactly what they are doing. But you and I come to this place because the dividing wall of hostility has been torn down. And you and I now, even though we would have not a whole lot in common outside of the gospel, we come together through the gospel. And we have peace with one another. Is there potential conflict? Absolutely. Do we come together in this place as people who are not there yet? And will we have disagreement? Will we have offense at times? You better believe it. But there is the potential here for us to overlook offense. There is the potential here for us to consider one another better than ourselves. To serve one another by honoring the, the other person is the potential here and the unity, the peace that is brought through the gospel with people. God provides peace with ourselves even in the gospel. You know, the, the peace that we need with ourselves instead of the insecurities and the habits and all those things that we say, why do I do this? Instead, we can look at Philippians chapter 1, 6 and say with confidence, I'm sure that he who began a good work in me will complete it at the day of Christ Jesus. We look at these things and we say, yeah, this, this, this bothers me. We're like Paul and he says, you know, I don't do the things that I want to do. Instead, I go on doing the things that I hate. There's still going to be that reality for us. But we can come to those and say, that God's not finished, and I know that he will indeed see me all the way through to the end, that his power will hold me to glory, and that these things that bother me, as much as they bother me, they bother him enough that he will not allow these things to enter into his presence. They won't be allowed into heaven, so he's going to see us through to make us fit for there. Those whom he has predestined, he has decided he will conform to the image of Christ, right? And so we have now peace through the gospel with God, with people, with ourselves. One day we will have peace with creation itself. The Bible says that one day the, the lion will lay down with the lamb, right? That the child will play over the pit of vipers and not worry about any kind of danger or any destruction there. One day creation will fall, fall back in line. It will be brought back in line through the gospel. God will set everything right. The headlines that you read and the, and the news stories that you watch that break your heart now will be eradicated because creation will once again be what God made it to be. 
We have peace through the gospel. So what for us? So what is the point, Pastor? Well, here's the third point, and this is the takeaway. As a result, that you and I have peace with God, with ourselves, with other people, and with creation through the gospel, the result is that you and I can bear the fruit of peace, even in the now. And this is pretty obvious, but I want to point these things out to you. And, and you say, well, Pastor, how? How can I bear the fruit of peace? Well, let me give you some ways. Number one, trust God. Trust God. Do you know that, that anybody can have peace when circumstances are tranquil? You know, you will go somewhere this, this summer, maybe perhaps you'll go to a beach somewhere, or you'll go to the mountains, you'll sit by the stream, and, and, uh, and it'll be cool in the shade, and maybe you'll, you'll stick your feet in that stream, and it'll be cold, and it'll be just so refreshing, and, and perhaps you'll watch squirrels play in the trees, and, and all of these things, you'll kick back in your chair, and you'll say, man, this is, this is peaceful right here. But you know, that kind of peace, is, there's nothing special about it. Anybody can have that peace. It doesn't take the gospel to have that type of peace. That peace is temporary. Biblical peace is peace that is there in the midst of whatever is going on. Whatever the storm is doing around you, that's biblical peace. When you have peace and you're trusting in the Lord in that moment. There was a, um, a, a man who commissioned several artists and he said, I, I want to find the perfect picture of peace. And he, so he, he put out this this. Uh, this payment for whoever could bring him this perfect painting of peace. And so several artists painted these things. They brought them to him. And finally, one was brought, and it was this picture of anything but what you would consider to be peace. It showed this, this huge waterfall coming over the, the, the edge of these, this rocky face and water crashing everywhere. And behind that was, were these dark storm clouds. And it was just absolutely just a nasty scene. And as you followed that waterfall down the rocky face, you saw one little tree that was growing out of the side of that rock face. And if you look closer, you could see in that tree a nest in one of the little crooks of the elbow of one of those branches. And in that nest, you could see this bird who was there with his little baby birds, and it was resting in the sovereignty of its God as creator. The reality is, for you and I, that, that bird will never know a peace like you and I know through the gospel. That we rest in the sovereignty of our God, not just in this, this, this common grace of creation, but in the special grace of the gospel. That Jesus Christ has died in our place. That he was raised so that you and I might be raised as well. And that we might live with him forever. That our sins have been forgiven and that he has given us his righteousness. And that one day he will come again and we will be with him where he is. And in the meantime, we rest and we trust that what he is doing is necessary to make us ready for that day. The Bible here, Isaiah 26, verse 3 says, You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. I would implore you, whatever is going on in your life, trust in the Lord. Wait on him, Isaiah 40 says. I've got a friend from the gym who posted this morning. They just had a baby. They're still in the hospital with their infant. And everything was fine for the first 24 hours. And then while they were holding that baby... All of a sudden, the baby went limp, and the lips turned blue for about 30 seconds. And everything kind of came out, and everything seemed to be okay. And a few hours later, the same sort of thing happened again. They rushed the baby in, decided to observe the baby. Uh, for, for a while, they came back and delivered the baby back to the parents and said, nothing's wrong, everything's normal, just sort of something that happened. And as, they, as the parents were relieved, a few hours after they were relieved, for a full minute, the baby went completely blue and was not breathing. The baby is now in the NICU in, in Greenville and uh, is being observed, have EEGs and all sorts of things that are going on. I would ask you to pray for that family. Right now, th those parents are in a storm. I, I shared with them on Facebook this morning, and I prayed that, that the, the peace that passes all understanding would guard their hearts and their minds that, that is in Christ Jesus. That's the only way they will have peace. I, I pray, Lord willing, that that baby, that they'll find out what it is and they'll be able to correct whatever the issue is. I pray even before that that God would heal that child. But I pray in the middle of that storm that they would know a peace that is beyond understanding. 
Do you know that, that when Jesus was in the boat on the water, when the disciples were afraid that they were going to drown, that Jesus came walking out to them on the water, and, and they realized it was him, and, and Peter said, Jesus, let me come to you on the water. And Jesus invited him to come out, and Peter stepped out on the water, and he began to walk toward Jesus. And it was this miraculous thing that Jesus allowed him to participate in. And as long as he kept his eyes there on Jesus, Peter had no issues. But the Bible says specifically that when he noticed the wind and the waves around him, he suddenly began to sink. So the reality is for you and I that whatever is going on in your life, if you allow yourself to be distracted and get your focus on all the things that could go wrong, all the things that are going wrong, then you will not trust in the Lord. But if you will cling to and look to the one who holds everything in his sovereign hands and promises to bring everything to good for the one who loves him and is called according to his purpose, you can trust him and know that whatever happens, that he is good and he is worthy to be praised. That he loves you more than you love yourself. And that he promises to bring you to where he is. So trust God. The second thing I would tell you to do is pray. You know, Trusting God is not just this passive activity where we're supposed to just sit back and say, okay, Lord, I, I don't know, I'm trusting you. But he gives us this, this tangible way to actually express that trust, and it is prayer. You and I get to, get to have an audience with the one who promises to hear and can do something about it. I got up in the middle of the night and um, don't even remember what was on my mind. Something came to my mind, and I, and I remember thinking about there's something that just, it, it, it alarmed me for, for a little bit. It was, I, I don't even remember now. But I remember in the middle of the night, it was probably two or three in the morning, and, and I remember in that moment saying, God, intervene. God, please help in this situation. And then I began to think, what an incredible privilege it is that at two o'clock in the morning, I can cry out to God, and he hears because he never slumbers. He never takes a break. He's there. He invites me to do that. He says, cast your burdens on me. He promises to hear, to hear our prayers and, and to take those burdens from us. You know what? I went back to bed. I don't remember anything after that because I went right to sleep. God invites us to pray, so trust him. Pray. Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7 says, Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Third, be a peacemaker. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. You and I, perhaps this is the most tangible expression, perhaps, maybe, this is the point of, uh, or Paul's point in Galatians 5, talking about the fruits of the Spirit, that this is the way it would be manifested the most. In the, in the context of living with other people, that we would seek to be peacemakers. That we would overlook our offenses, and, and it, it's Proverbs, I think, 21 or, or somewhere in there says that it's, it's an honor, it's a glory to overlook an offense. Romans 12, verse 18, though, says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. See, the reality is God calls us to be peacemakers, but Romans 12, 18 reminds us that there are some cases where it's not possible to live peaceably with all. The very fact here that it says, if possible, as far as it depends on you, points to the fact that there are some circumstances where we cannot just simply look the other way. We simply cannot overlook the offense because the offense is not... Our, 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 our preference or, or our feelings, but instead the offense is against a holy God. See, the reality is that, that God has drawn lines. That God has drawn lines and he says, this far you will go and, and not any further. And the reality is that culture on the other side, outside of Christ, they look at us and they say, are you seriously going to keep that line? That line is bigoted, it is offensive, you need to do away with that line. The reality for us as believers, we don't get to then take the line and move it back. We don't get to erase the line. We don't get to adjust the line. Because God is the one who sets the lines. But nor do we get to, on the other side, move the line forward. 
nor do we get to draw additional lines where, the God, where the God has not drawn lines. We take the lines where God has drawn them, and he says, this is right, this is wrong, and we must not compromise those. So as far as it is possible for you to live peaceably with all people, do so. But if it is not possible, then we must take a stand. Things will not get easier for the church going forward in America. The culture will continue to turn up the heat. Now, we've had some good news in recent days. We had a, a good decision that came out of the Supreme Court for religious liberty. But don't take that as a signal that everything is now turning around. The Bible tells us that in the end, in the last days, that things will grow worse and worse. If you're expecting to come to Christ and everything just fall in line for you, you're coming with false expectations. We must... Seek to live peaceable with all people and to, and to be peacemakers, but that does not mean that we, we pull lines away from where God has drawn them. Fourth, strive to be holy in thought and deed. Strive. Strive. You say, how can I strive? How can striving bring peace to my life? Striving seems like that would bring angst to my life. Striving seems like that would bring just frustration and, and pressure. And then I might have anxiety over striving. Pastor, you really want me to strive for holiness in thought and deed? How can striving produce peace? Well, it all depends on the starting line. If you are starting with your striving at, I'm striving in order for God to receive me, then you're right. It will bring no peace to you at all. If you think that somehow religion can somehow make you acceptable to God, if you're striving to, to be a good person and to add these things to your life, then it will not bring peace at all. It will only bring frustration and anxiety and, and, and lack of assurance for you. But if you're starting at the place where, not starting and trying to be received by God, but in, in essence, you're starting at the finish line that you have been received by God, and then you strive from there, it takes all the pressure off. You know, I'm, I'm not dependent on my ability to keep myself holy. The Bible tells me that in Christ I am holy, that I have been made righteous, and I am free in that. And now I am, I am at peace to be able to pursue the Lord. And when I fail, I can come back to him and say, Lord, would you forgive me? Lord, I, I really messed up here. Lord, would you would you Give me the, the grace to pick, up, pick myself up and to go from here to, to, to find myself squarely and totally in you and what you've done for me alone and let me, let me strive to be holy in my living so that I would please you. The, the Bible here tells us that we are to strive to be holy in thought and deed. Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is in any excellence, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things, what you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. See, the Bible tells us here that striving for holiness in thought and deed is a way that brings peace when you come at it from already being in the gospel. And then fifth, be an agent of peace. Be an agent of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20 says, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Do you know that there is, there is a world that lives outside of maybe your sphere most of the time? Maybe you don't know a whole, whole lot of unbelievers. Most of your friends are, are Christians perhaps. And if that's the case, I would implore you to, to find some avenue where you can be around people who don't know the Lord. Because the Bible has told us that we are to be these agents of reconciliation. That the peace that you and I now have with God through the gospel, that we are not to hoard it, hoard it for ourselves. That we are not to find this good thing and say, man, I have peace with God, and never share that with anyone else. But instead, we are to go out and tell others how they also might come to have peace with God. And in coming to have peace with God, they will find themselves at peace with people, at peace with themselves, eventually at peace with creation because they will know the Lord Jesus and he will bring everything to his appointed end. May the peace of God, may the peace of Christ rule 
in our hearts. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, we confess to you that so many times, Lord, we strive for peace in so many other places. Or we seek to find it in, in so many other avenues. Or perhaps even sometimes we, we sometimes think that we don't even need peace in certain, certain areas. But Lord, today your word tells us, it shows us clearly that, Lord, that we need peace. God, I thank you for the peace that is offered and provided for us in the gospel. Lord, I pray that if there are people listening to this sermon today, God, that you might bring peace into their hearts, into their lives, God, through the gospel. That if there's someone here who has never turned from their sin and trusted in you and you alone, that God, today, you might bring peace into their lives, cause them to cross over from death to life. And the war that they are in, Lord, would you set them free. Lord, for all those who are here today and they are believers, they're Christians, Lord, I pray, God, that we would know that what a gift we have in, in, in the gospel of peace. Lord, would you help us to know the reality of peace more and more every day. As John 15 tells us, Lord, as we abide in you, that you would produce the fruit of peace in our lives. God, there are people in, the, in listening to this sermon today in this room who are going through all sorts of things. God, things that I don't know about, things that only they are, 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 are aware of, things that are harder than I will ever know. But God, I pray that in the middle of it, that they would experience a peace that is beyond understanding. Lord, that in the middle of whatever storm they are in, that you would be made much of, and they would cling and trust to you because you are indeed good. You are good in all things, and you promise to bring good to all those who trust and love you. God, would you glorify yourself in us by making us at peace squarely in the gospel of Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to give you an opportunity to reflect on the sermon this morning and to respond appropriately. However the Lord has, has spoken to you, whatever he has, he has led you to do today, I want you to know you have freedom to respond. If today you need to come and you just need to pray and cast a burden out to him, that second point of application was pray. Perhaps, maybe, just come and kneel across the front here and cast a burden. Bring it to the Lord. Don't, be, don't hang on to it and allow it to produce anxiety in your life. But instead, bring it to Him. Maybe you're here today and you've never trusted the Lord as your Savior. And right now, you don't know the peace that I've spoken of. You know all too well that I'm exactly right. That, there is, that you need peace with God, with people creation with yourself I'm telling you the only place that it can be found is in Christ if you know that today I would love to have the privilege of leading you to trust the Lord as your Savior I'll be seated on the front row I'd love for you to come and speak with me I'd love to just just show you what the gospel what the Bible tells us about salvation in Jesus alone I don't know how else the Lord has led but you do and so I would implore you just to say yes, whatever it is that he's leading you to today, would you say yes and respond and find him to be the giver of peace?